This is the Arab horse ring at Bakewell Show in Derbyshire. And somebody has to judge which of these horses is going to be champion. You want the horse with Arab characteristics, beautiful head, level croup, high carry tail, but you also want it to combine the attributes of a good riding horse. It isn't going to be easy. They all look pretty impressive, and so they should be. After all, they've been specially bred for the ring, and most of them have been bred from champions. Is it any easier in here? It's a very sound belly colour, which a lot of them fail today. Uh, and it's, it's got a nice, even, dense coat and it's, it's a good type to have it. Again, not easy to pick a champion when they've all been bred from winning stock. But why should it be? After all, rabbits reproduce in the same way as horses. So if we mated a champion buck with a champion doe, can we guarantee anything more than a black rabbit? This is what happened. Hang on, how come there's a white one? The problem lies in how animals like horses and rabbits reproduce. They reproduce sexually, and with sexual reproduction, there can be no guarantees. Over to the flower show. All very pretty. But what's happened here? These flowers are perfect, and they're all identical. Can the flower grower guarantee producing perfect blooms? If we take seed, if we let the plant go to seed and take the seed out of the pod, it can be anything. It doesn't come true to the mother plant. It doesn't come, wouldn't come the same as this yellow and red. It could be anything. Well, the only way to reproduce a carnation is to take a cutting off the stem. This is the ideal perpetual flowering carnation cutting. So we take all of it like that, pull it straight out of the stem, and there we go. That's ready for now going into the propagator. What we do next is we take the knife, cut off a sixteenth below a node, which is a pair of leaves, insert it into the rooting powder, and then put it into our tray which next goes under the misting unit. There will be little plants in 14 or 15 days. Gardeners have been taking cuttings like this for centuries. But now, watch this. What's happening here? This is called cloning. It involves taking a tiny slice, a collection of cells, of a plant near the base of the stem. It's put into a nutrient medium. Kept warm. and new plants grow. So it's similar to taking a cutting, but different. Watch again to see what's different. They both achieve the same result new plants identical to the original. But how does it work? Well, reproduction is all about producing new individuals and passing on genetic information to the next generation. That information is held in the cells. This is a single cell. Watch what happens. The cell is dividing. The process is called mitosis, and it happens in most living things. Mm -hmm. 
Let's look again. This is the nucleus of a cell, and this is a chromosome. It's a long strand of protein and a substance called DNA, and it contains genes. Genes hold the information about the characteristics of the organism. In order to transmit that information, each chromosome has to copy itself, forming pairs called chromatids. Try and watch what happens with this pair. The right-hand one's the easiest to see. This is where they end up. All the pairs of chromatids have separated in the same way. Eventually, the nucleus will divide and two new cells will be formed. What genetic information will those new cells have? It will be identical to the information carried in the original cell. But what has this got to do with cuttings and cloning? Well, both of them rely on this process of cell division. In cloning, the trick is to catch the plant tissue very early on, before it has developed any specialized functions. From those cells, division like mitosis will produce a fully developed plant. How does cloning differ from taking cuttings? Well, with cuttings, the piece of stem that's taken is actually a partially developed plant. Some cells have already begun to be specialized. But both these techniques produce offspring that are identical to the original parent. It's called asexual reproduction. The beauty of cloning in particular is that hundreds, if not thousands, of new plants can be grown from the cells of just one parent. It's the technique used by big nurseries to produce plants for sale. Now that's all very well for plants, but you can't do the same thing by taking a slice off a rabbit. No, the business of producing rabbits is quite different. It is sexual reproduction, and it can lead to surprises, like our white rabbit. So back to that conundrum. How did two black rabbits produce a white one? To understand that, we really have to get under the skin. This represents the chromosomes in a cell of a rabbit. There are 22 matching pairs. Take any of the pairs, each member of a pair carries a similar set of genes coding for a particular type of information. In the case of our champion rabbit, for instance, one of its pairs of genes codes for the color of its coat, black. But the other parent has a black coat too. So why did they produce a litter which includes a white rabbit? Let's look at the chromosomes again in more detail. This pair of chromosomes has the genes for coat color highlighted, but they're not exactly the same. They're in the same position on each chromosome, but one of the pair is carrying the code for black coat color and one the code for white. The alternatives are known as alleles. But our rabbits look distinctly black or white. None of them is a mixture of black and white. Why? It's because the black color gene is hiding the effects of the white color gene. We say that black is dominant and white is recessive. It's usually written like this, capital letter for dominant, small letter for recessive. But how did this information get in there? Buck rabbit, 22 pairs of chromosomes. Doe, 22 pairs. And their baby, 44 pairs? No, 22 again. How come? It's all down to sex cells. Here's an ordinary cell. Now the same animal, but a sex cell. Notice any difference? That's right. In the sex cell, there's only half the number of chromosomes. In other words, it only has half the information of an ordinary cell. Remember the cells dividing that we saw earlier? Well, it's similar in the formation of sex cells, but uh, well, different. The formation of sex cells is called meiosis. We'll show only the pair of chromosomes with genes for coat colouring, but what we're about to see applies to all the pairs. 
As in mitosis, each chromosome splits into two chromatids. The chromosomes arrange themselves along the center line of a supporting spindle of threads. This time, each member of the pair of chromosomes, that is, both chromatids, moves to opposite ends of the cell. The nuclear membrane reappears. The cell undergoes its first division. So, what have we got here? Two new cells, but each with only one half of the original genetic code. These new cells now begin a second division. This time, the individual chromatids separate. The cell once again divides. There are now four separate cells from the one original, and each contains only half the original genetic code. So what this means is that in sexual reproduction, two parents are needed for a full genetic code to be passed on to the offspring. So let's look at what happened when our two rabbits were mated. The parents are both black in outward appearance. And let's look at the genetic information they carry about their color. Each is carrying one dominant gene coding for black fur, big B, and one recessive gene for white fur, little b, alternative forms of the coat color gene. So what happens when they mate? Remember, any sperm can join with any egg. How many possible combinations are there? Our baby rabbits have a 1 in 4 chance of having all black genes. A 2 in 4 chance of having a black and a white gene. And a 1 in 4 chance of having two recessive genes, unlike either parent. So four combinations of eggs. What possible color combinations are there? Three black, one white. And here they are. We can represent our rabbit family tree like this. Here are the black parents, and these are the offspring. That's the theory. Fine if you have at least four baby rabbits in a litter, but of course you can't tell just by looking at a rabbit whether it's got big bees or little bees. There are all sorts of combinations of coat color. Can you see how recessive genes can skip generations and come out later? And if you think that's complicated, it's even worse in horses. Congratulations. Thanks very much. <laughs> Do you know how she's bred? Um, she's by a stallion called White Spirit. Yes. Silver Spirit. Silver Spirit, yes. Um, just out of a yes. home. A horse, in fact, has 64 chromosomes. That's 32 pairs in each cell, compared with the rabbit's 22. Thank you, ma'am. So the possible combinations of characteristics, everything from size, shape, colour, character, are enormous. There is no guarantee that a beautiful mare will produce beautiful offspring, but it is actually slightly more likely. You do try and breed the best to the best, but it doesn't always work. Sexual reproduction in whatever species is a lot more complicated than asexual reproduction, and a lot less predictable. So why does it carry on? Why bother with sexual reproduction? Why aren't we all busy cloning? Well, asexual reproduction poses its own set of problems. Take plants that are identical. If a disease were to infect one of them, it could infect all of them. Think of it in terms of a whole population of organisms. One disease could wipe out the lot but sexual reproduction creates variation. It allows new mixtures of genes that might not exist in either parent. And it's variation which ensures survival in an unpredictable world. Sexual reproduction is what allows species to thrive, develop and adapt to changing conditions. Most plants reproduce sexually for that very reason. In the wild, it comes naturally. Sexual reproduction is what makes the world such a varied place. There's only one problem. Genetics isn't everything. Listen to this. Originally, you're looking for something out of the ordinary, like a freak. Now, if 
just say a beetroot. If a farmer was growing 400, uh, four acres or hectares of beetroot, then there may be one freak in that field bigger than anything. So if you harvest that, uh, grow it on for seed, try and isolate it because very, very often they revert back to their normal uh, habit. But now and again you can hold them. If you hold them for one year, then what I do, I cross it with another huge variety and then once you've got one cross into it, you've cracked it. It's been given more room, more fertilizer, more space, more attention, more everything than you would give just a normal marrow. So, I, I mean, you're giving nature its hand and it's, it's been growing in the Grand Hotel of, uh, of uh, marrows, you know. So it's not just about genes. What this all means is the genes are the starting point. Nature makes the first offer of characteristics, but the environment will have a say then in how far that potential can develop. It's known as the nature versus nurture argument, and who knows which is more important? Well, they might soon here. Look at these two young horses. What do you notice about them? They look very similar, and they should, because they're genetically identical. They have to be. They came from the same fertilized egg. Here's another pair. Identical twins never occur in horses naturally, but these are among only four pairs of identical twins in the world, and they're all at this farm in Cambridge. They've been created artificially. The parents mated in the normal way, sexually of course. But after six days, the embryo was removed from the womb. Under the microscope, it is no more than a tiny cluster of undifferentiated cells. It would look something like this, but it can be divided. The two halves of the embryo were implanted into two different mares, and two foals developed. So, one embryo, one set of genetic information, two genetically identical foals. They're very similar, but Cordelia, I think perhaps, which is this one, that one, sorry, <laughs> she's perhaps a bit more dominant than the other. Um, but they are very similar, they run, they work together, uh, they run together, they boss the others around. But imagine if they were separated. What if they reared these two youngsters in different ways? Took one to Australia, even. How would they develop? Which would have the more lasting impact? Their genes or their environment? <laughs> <laughs>